Hey guys, welcome back to my Rust beginner tutorial. And we're going to pick up right where we left off on the blockchain info app. So we just created these structs and we're ready to start deserializing the JSON payload into Rust objects. So we talked about how our main RS file is actually going to import all of our other modules. So let's stick with that pattern and let's just create another new file. And in this one, we're going to do all of our like HTTP requests and we're going to create some functions that are going to actually do the calling of that now nodes endpoint. So we're going to just call it blockchain info. And with that created, let's start developing the act of going to that rest endpoint and getting that information. So we're going to use request. We're going to use Tokyo and we're going to use Saturday and we're going to use result trait. Okay, cool. So now let's define a constant for our entire like module here. And we're just going to make it that like root URL string. So we're going to make it a string slice. And this is going to be that endpoint from basically from the status one. Like this is going to be the one that we're going to want to use because all of the other endpoints are built right off of this root. Like once you get to that API part, that's where things start to change. So we'll keep that in a constant and put it up at the top here. And now as we go, we're obviously going to be relying on making multiple calls to the API. So let's make one method that we can reuse and do those API calls. So we're going to first do a public method or public function. We'll just call it send request. And it's going to take the URL as a string slice. And it's going to return to us a string. Now in it, here's where we're going to use request. So let's do let client equal request client new. And this will create oh, new. This will create a new client object that will come pre-configured with all of the components that we need to make calls to our API. So to do that, you just type client dot get since we're doing a get request and we're going to just hit whatever URL we're passed in up at the top. So there's a couple things you got to do in Rust to handle different things like that. And we're going to cover that as we define this function. So I'm going to space these things out by just doing this and dropping them down to a new line so we can cover each item that we're going to add here to our client command. So the first one is going to be get. That's going to build a basic get request. Now, we have to add our API key to the get request in order for it to be authenticated. Like we had to do it in Postman in order to get these responses. So how do we do that in Rust? Well, you want to add what's called a header. So we're going to create the header and just like you saw in Postman, the key is going to be API key. And now our value is going to be our API key. But we talked about how we want to not have this be a hard coded value. Like we want this to be something that is hidden from like just anybody being able to read it. So I alluded to this earlier. What we're going to do is utilize the dot env package here. And what dot env allows you to do is obviously pull in environment variables. But where do you define these? Well, there are Rust modules that allow you to just have environment variables like on your system, or if you're using Docker, you could have them in your Docker image. But what we're going to actually do is create a dot env file. And that file goes not in your source folder, but in your cargo folder. So in blockchain info app, we're going to create a new file called dot env. And you can see Visual Studio Code recognizes it as a config. And all you want to do is just type API key equals your API key in double quotes here, just like I have it. This is exactly what it should look like. So I went and added my API key to that dot n file off screen. So once you've got it in there and it's in quotes, you can change this here to actually use our dot env module. So just type dot env var 
and then the key and we set it to API underscore key. So now dot env is going to pull that in for the dot env file. But this is actually going to be implementing the option like we've seen before. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little like shorthand way to handle an option that comes back as none. So in other words, in this case, if dot env goes to try to find that API key value in our dot n file and it's not there, we're going to do dot expect and expect is just an error handling tool. And we're just going to say could not find API key. Pretty simple. Could not find key API key. So if you get that, that comes up on your terminal, Rust will actually throw what's called a panic and it will stop your application. And this is the output that you'll have. And you'll know that, okay, it wasn't able to get my key. Awesome. So we built a header for this and we're going to be able to successfully authenticate with our API key. And now we're just going to send that request as we built it. So in order to send a request, since we talked about how we're using Tokyo and stuff, you actually want to add this await key. Now I just want to point out there's other ways to do rest calls, but I felt like from my research, this was by far the easiest way to do it. So if you can handle just sticking a weight in there because of the parallel processing, you're going to be fine. So before we go any further, since we mentioned that Tokyo is going to be conducting this, what we want to do is actually add the Tokyo annotation. So we're just going to add that hash and a bracket, Tokyo, whoops, and main. So that's going to be our main Tokyo function there. And because we're using Tokyo, you want to make this an async function. That's beyond the scope of this tutorial, but in a nutshell, like I said before, it's going to make it asynchronous. You could conduct these rest calls sequentially if you're not asynchronous, or if you are asynchronous, you can do them in parallel. Anyways, that is enough to give us what we want from that endpoint. Now, we will also want to add this expect key in case that endpoint fails. So we're going to say fail to get response in here. And we're going to handle the error that way as well. Now, one more feature we want to add is if we make it this far and we don't throw a panic on this failed to get response section here, we want to actually convert the payload that we get back from that API call into text. And it's just that text keyword there. And so then you're going to just add the await and the expect. And I'm going to just say failed to convert payload, right? So now that this is set up, you can see we omitted the semicolon and this is going to be a string text. So we're good. We satisfy our return value. And this is what our function here is going to kick back to anything that calls it. Excellent. Now that that's set up, let's see this in action. So we're going to just quickly define a function and we'll store our functions in here. Um, just for simplicity's sake, and then we'll drive them all from main. So if we just do like blockchain status request, I'm not going to pass any vars into that. And we're going to return that blockchain status struct. Now we can't do that without pulling that into our application. So what we need to do is actually go ahead and import it. and real quick, I just want to call out this import is supposed to be Saturday underscore JSON and then the result trade, not just Saturday. So make sure you correct that. That will allow us to do the deserialization properly. So like we said, we need to actually also use from our current crate. So the crate keyword, the blockchain status, blockchain status, struct. And that's what that looks like when you want to pull it in from another Rust file that's in your source folder. So really quickly, I'm going to add all three of the ones we're going to be using, just so you guys don't have to see me do it again. So that's going to be our status, our address and our transaction. Now, right now, this isn't enough to use this in a separate file from main, right? Like this module itself, blockchain info.rs, knows that it needs these things from the current crate. But in order for them to be in the current crate, we actually need to do a little bit of configuration in main RS. 
So you got to think about it like this. Main RS is the root and it's going to tell your Rust application all of the things that it needs to know. So when the blockchain info module is saying it needs to use these particular items from the crate in main, you tell it that that crate includes them. And that looks like this, the mod keyword. That means bring in this module. So this is what you use to bring in other Rust files. So we're simply going to just add mod and we're going to tell main that we want to use our other Rust files. So very simple. We're just going to type the name of the file. So blockchain status, we'll start with actually blockchain info. We'll get all four of those. So our main function that we're writing over there, and then we'll also do um, our status, our address, and our transactions. Cool. So now that that's done, we also need to tell Rust that we're going to be using Serde and that that's part of a different crate, not our own. And we did specify it in Cargo Toml here. But what we need to do is we need to actually tell it, okay, we want to use the macros from that module. And you add this macro annotation, macro use, and then extern crate, and we're going to do Serde derive. Now this will bring in the macros from Serde Derive that will allow us to do the deserialization that we've been teasing at. Nice. So I hope that's not too much to unpack, but this is in a nutshell how you tell main to include all those files. And that will in turn make these use declarations valid. And really quickly, just make sure that you have the different modules in here. When I copy pasted, I want to make sure that you guys change this over to address and transaction here so that we get the proper imports like this should be coming from each module individually. So let's go back down to our method. Let's just take out this return type for now so we can see what's going on with that payload. So for some of you guys who are pretty astute and who may have been uh, spotting something strange here, why are we going to text if we're going to be going from JSON to a struct, right? Like that's kind of strange. Why are we returning a string if that's what we're going to be doing? Well, it turns out, as we'll see, that string, this text function here, it actually is going to produce a string representation of the JSON object. So you'll see that it's separated with like brackets and stuff. And it's a string that is easily convertible to a JSON in the compiler. So we're going to take a look at what that looks like completely. So anyway, back to the method. And we're just going to type let response equal send request. And since we're starting with just the status endpoint, and we already talked about how like this is the endpoint right here, we're just going to be able to pass in a reference to that host root value. And that'll be the entire URL that we need to get the status. And so we're just going to want to take a look at what's going on here. So we're going to print line. And we're just going to print the response. So you can see what I mean by like that string representation of a JSON. So we'll save that. And now over here, we're going to take out hello world and we're just going to reference that module blockchain info. And we're going to specifically reference this function blockchain status request. And notice since we made them all public, we can do that like public. We talked about it with the structs that allows these things to be used across modules. So we don't have to pass anything in, save it. And let's just see what happens when we do a cargo run. Get a couple of warnings, but right here, you can see our output is that whole body, the same body we saw in Postman here. And this is what I mean by it being a string representation of a JSON. You have all of the brackets, all of the colons, everything's enclosed in quotes. So this is parsable by your compiler and by different modules you use to turn it into a JSON object. So that's why it works as a string in that particular method that we're using. So I'll clear this out and let's go back to what we were doing. So we had our return value as the blockchain status. And this is going to make me type the whole thing out. Okay. So blockchain status is our return type. So we're going to get rid of this print statement here. 
And this is where the magic is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. This is where we're going to see that conversion from the payload to the struct. Serde JSON from STR. We're going to reference the response value, that string. And now since this is, again, another option return type, we're going to have to add the expect keyword. And all this is really doing, like I said before, is it's just a shorthand for how you want to handle errors. And it automatically will just throw a panic and stop your app. So if that happens, we're going to say failed to parse JSON. Nice. We're going to omit the semicolon because this whole line here is, if successful, going to create a blockchain status object with our fields from the payload. So let's flip back to main. And let's take a look at what that looks like if we write it a little bit differently here. So let's just, um, I guess we could take this and say let blockchain status equal this method here. And we'll specify the type as the blockchain status type. Now, before we go any further, we told blockchain info as a module that we were going to be using the blockchain status struct but we didn't tell that to main we told it to import these modules but we didn't tell it that we're going to be using anything here so we also have to add those use keywords here so it's literally the exact same thing you see in here you can literally copy paste them you need to tell main the same exact thing and now this will become acceptable to use and so once we've done that let's just do like a print line and we're going to say, let's put a little message there. We're going to say querying and a variable there, chain, and then, and what we're going to pass in there is actually, we're going to say querying whatever coin, and obviously it's going to be Bitcoin on chain, and we're going to be on main. So this is where we're going to reference the attributes of our struct. So we saw that our struct contains these substructs and inside them our active attributes are going to be the coin and the chain so to access those we saw it in the struct work from the videos in the past we're going to just reference the struct that we get back blockchain status and then dot blockbook dot coin that's going to give us the coin and again reference the same thing blockchain status dot backend dot chain and now if we print that out we're going to get the information from our response about the chain there you go querying bitcoin chain main so you could see that it totally worked we totally just converted a json body into a struct and then returned it to this method and we're able to reference the parts of that struct the attributes specifically using rust syntax so this is incredibly powerful and this is a great segue into the rest of the application where we're going to actually use these same processes to build out the full app that you guys saw in that diagram from the previous video